give the young ones a chance to head on downstairs. If you have a younger one in the sound of my voice, ages four and under, there's an infant toddler nursery downstairs full time. I don't really see any this morning, but sometimes they try to hang in service. If they don't enjoy the pastor's preaching, at any point there is a nursery downstairs. Last Sunday morning, for those who were here as a matter of reaffirmation, and for those who weren't, we began a new uh, series that'll last a good part of the summer entitled One Another. And there'll be one slide, and that's it for today, Taryn. Thank you for your help back there. Without setting too much of a foundation and offering too much of an intro, I want to just say that the phrase one another appears literally dozens of times in the New Testament each time addressing some unique fa facet of our obligation to our fellow man. And it's the purpose of this series to, to look at these texts, to bring them before our corporate attention, and to allow the Lord to speak to us through them in a timeless and a timely way. If you were not here last Sunday, uh, I spent a good 35 minutes kind of building a big foundation that's, that, that's meant to support much of this series. Uh, I don't have time to really delve back into any of that. Please listen online, newlifeberry.org. You can listen to it, you can download it, you can read the notes that are always attached. Quick plug for the notes. I always have more in the notes than I have time to get into uh, publicly, so feel free to avail yourself of that free resource. Uh, Taryn uh, and beyond mentioned the access that we have to God's Word. That's just one more resource that if you desire, uh, it's there, it's free, it's accessible, it should be easy to, to get a hold of. If not, you can feel free to see me at any point. Again, that's newlifebarry.org. I want to just open with the following statement, and I want to spend a good 15 or so minutes breaking it down before we kind of go to the next level and go a little bit deeper. Biblically speaking, for those who are taking notes, the follower of Jesus Christ is called to do this radical thing called love. Love. If this is your first time stepping into a church, let me just say that much of the message of Christianity... And almost the entirety of our obligation to God and each other is founded upon the idea of love. And I want to spend just a few minutes looking at our obligation to love in a few different directions. So kind of bear with me as I go through these. Number one, the Christian is first and foremost called to love God. That is our chief, that is our primary duty, it is the reason that we exist. God made beings who were capable of receiving and reciprocating love. And I want to just read this to you. This comes out of Matthew 22. Don't turn there for now for the sake of time, but you can jot down the reference. This is Jesus speaking in response to the question, what is the greatest commandment? Somebody in the crowd asked him, Jesus, what is the most important lesson, the most important principle that we are to live by? And Jesus put it this way. This is how he opens it. Love the Lord your God just a little. See, I do that on purpose. It's not just for the laugh, but that's, that's kind of how we act at times. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, he says and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. In other words, your love for God can't just be a hobby, or an extracurricular activity, or a small facet of your life. Everything in your life is to be founded upon this governing principle of love the Lord completely. I have so many more texts I don't have the time to get into. I would recommend you read Luke chapter 14, where Jesus spells out the cost of being a disciple is a radical love for and priority of God. The idea that Christians can just serve God a little bit, love God a little bit, give him kind of the extra that's left over, that has nothing to do with biblical Christianity. Now, if you want that version of Christianity, there are many churches that will give that to you. But I warn you, that is not in line with what the word teaches. But moving on, number two, the Christian is also called to love their fellow man. And if you keep reading in Matthew 22, you'll see Jesus continue on his teaching of loving the Lord your God with every fiber of your being. And he'll say the next thing, love your neighbor as yourself. 
In other words, we are to love our neighbor to the degree in which we love and prioritize and think of ourselves. And Jesus, again, knowing that we're kind of fallen creatures who are pretty self-absorbed, he kind of turns that around on us and says, the amount that you think about and prioritize you, turn that thing outward and let your love go in that direction toward others. Now let's go to the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. I just want you to see this. I don't have time to fully break this down, but it is worth getting some eyes on the page. Luke chapter 10. What we're going to see in context is that somebody asked Jesus the question, all right, I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Who's my neighbor? A bit of a lawyer, in a sense, looking for a way out of the obligation. Okay, Jesus, I'm called to love my lawyer, but what's the loophole? Where's my exemption? How far does this commandment really stretch? And what we see in Luke chapter 10 is a very, very famous response in parable. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Again, I'm not going to have time to break all of this down, but I want you to see it with your own eyes. Please go home, read through this. Let the truths uh, that are contained within this speak to you. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. In other words, he's not really looking for the truth. He's trying to trip Jesus up. But he asks the question anyway, teacher... What must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question, asked for the wrong reasons. But Jesus deals with them anyway. What's written in the law, Jesus asked. How do you read it? Verse 27, the man answered, Love the Lord your God, this should sound familiar, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says in verse 28, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the man wanted to justify himself. He wanted to make himself look good. He wanted to elevate himself. So he asks the question, and here it is. Okay, so who's my neighbor? So here we go. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now let's just kind of pause and ask the question, is that what loving your neighbor should look like? No. So clearly Jesus is using this band of robbers as kind of the villain of the story. In other words, don't follow their example. Now verse 31, what are the first two words that you see or the first character that we meet besides the robbers in a sense? A priest. Now if you were a Jew in ancient Israel, the word priest meant something. In the second that the audience and this lawyer, in a sense, this expert in the law, asks the question, and Jesus replies and references a priest, this guy has to be the hero of the story. This guy has to be the person that I'm called to emulate because priests are these deeply religious figures who love God and love others. But look at what Jesus says. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man he passed by on the other side. Does that sound like loving your neighbor? No. Verse 32, so also this other figure now appears, a Levite, basically the associate of the priest, the, the, the group of people from which the priest came. This guy certainly should be the person that I'm called to emulate, but a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, so far, if you were in the audience, you have no idea where Jesus is going because he's basically dismantling all of the people that you thought would have been the heroes of the story. But he says something intriguing in verse 33. But a fill in the blank. If you were an ancient person in this time, in this culture, what's about to happen makes no sense. Because the Jewish people hated Samaritans. They viewed them as half-breeds, as dogs, as throwaway people, as outcasts, as people that good people, quote-unquote, didn't associate with. But a Samaritan, this despised figure, as he traveled, he came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity. He had compassion on him. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. Modern day translation, he gave him a ride with his own Ford Festiva. Do they still make Festivas? I digress. 
brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, verse 35, he took out two denarii, roughly two days' wages, and gave them to the innkeeper, look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And here Jesus goes for the jugular. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the teacher of the law had nothing to say except the one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus says something incredible. And I'll end this passage with this. Go and do likewise. In other words, your obligation isn't just to the Lord, and it's not just to those that you like and that you're comfortable with and look like you and have your value system and have it all together. I want you to follow the example of this despised Samaritan who was able to rise above all of the divides and division to serve and to show a practical form of love to one who was in need. So we are called to love God we are called to love our neighbor. Number three, let me begin to step on toes, including my own. We as Christians are also called to love, number three, our enemies. There are parts of the Bible, if I had a magic eraser, I would wipe them out. You all are looking at me like I would never do such a thing. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. How many of you find it a joy to love your enemy in your natural self? But that's what we're called to do. Like the Samaritan, by the way, who rose above his prejudice, prejudices and the, and the hatred of society to serve. Christians are called not just to love God, not just to love those in need, but now Jesus goes even deeper. You love your enemy. Matthew 5. I'll just read this to you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was a common line of the Pharisees at the time, religious leaders. But I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. I love verse 45 because what Jesus is saying is when you take the time to love your enemy, you are acting just like your Father who took the time to love you when you wanted no part of him, when you were an enemy. Verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Even the tax collectors, poor IRS agents. Let me give you a translation. Even the most sinful do that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Even the pagans, even non-believers do that. And then he ends with this crazy text, verse 48. Be perfect. Speaking of a completion, a wholeness. This manifestation of love that's even willing to love an enemy just as your heavenly father operates that way. We could spend a lot of time here. And I could say every eye closed and every head bowed on how many person at one point or another has had an enemy. And I think every hand would kind of go up. Maybe a boss, maybe a coworker, maybe a subordinate, maybe a neighbor, quite literally the person you share a fence or a border with. Maybe somebody in the church, I don't know. And our human instincts will tell us, this is what I will do in response to that person. Help the pastor out, act like I don't know anything. Somebody smacks you on your face, what's your instant reaction? To hit him back even harder. Somebody gossips about you. Ever been the victim of gossip, by the way? Brutally painful. Somebody slanders you, says something totally false and unsubstantiated. Ever experienced that? Somebody gossips about you, what's your instinct? to gossip back. It's not to make them a pie and help them if they're sick. But Jesus calls us to this crazy level. He doesn't even just say the traditional kind of forgive and forget. He says you be proactive. You go out of your way to serve, to love. I'm going to read to you a verse that comes out of the book of Romans chapter 12. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I love that. We're called to love God, 
We're called to love our neighbors, speaking of those who are in need, even if they're different from us. We are called to love our enemy, and I promise I'm going somewhere with this point number four. We Christians are called, you ready? To love one another. You see on the slide behind me, it says one another. This is the point that's going to tie it to this. We are called to love God. We are called to love our neighbor, those who are in need. We are called to love our enemies. But the Bible places a huge emphasis on loving one another. In the context of this is always an affection within the body of Christ. Now, I think quite often churches focus too much inwardly. So I want to be careful with this point because there is a lost world out there that needs Jesus and they need to, to see the church serving them. But we've got to talk about this radical concept called love one another. Now, in your bulletins, there was an insert placed last week and this week. And what you see in said insert is a listing of all the Bible verses that reference one another. And I kind of gave you the challenge, take the week, take it home, look through it, look at the Bible verses, spend time with how often and in how many different ways the Bible calls us to somehow horizontally, in a sense, affect one another in a positive way. And the number of times that love one another appears, it's so often. If you were to take that total list of 40 to 50 Bible verses, probably 15 to 20 of those that I'm ballparking, command us to love one another. Again, this singular command, not just love God, not just love the people outside of the building in a sense, not just love our enemy, but to love one another. So this, in a sense, is a very inward command because as Christians, we are called to operate as a family. And family can be messy. How many of you have families and realize family can be messy? Yeah, that's all of us. Don't raise your hand too quickly. But we all have them. But time and again, we are told, love one another. Love one another. John 13, John 15, Romans 12, Romans 13, 1 Peter 1 and 3, 1 John 3, 1 John 4, 2 John verse 5. Each time the command is the same, love one another. It's this drumbeat that appears in Scripture. Now, I'm a little bit thick at times. And the Lord has to tell me things a lot for it to sink into my heart and into my head. He says it a lot because it's a lesson that we need to hear a lot, because it's easy for us to kind of default to do the opposite. And I want to spend just a few minutes with you looking at a few points on this theme of love one another. And just give me the last 10 or 15 minutes, we'll begin to move to a close. Let's go to the Gospel of John. And I want to look at chapter 13. And I want to just give you two or three quick bullet points on the theme of loving one another and its importance. John 13, we're going to read a decent amount, not a crazy amount, but enough to give us some context here. We're going to begin in verse 1 of John 13, but I want to just share something from verse 34. Don't turn there, but Jesus says the following, a new command I give you, love one another. And then he says the following, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Let me kind of paraphrase that a little bit. I want the love that you have for each other to mimic and resemble the kind of love that I showed you. Let's ask the question, what kind of love did Jesus demonstrate while he was on the earth? Hands raised, help the pastor out, give me some words. Jesus' love was all all encompassing. Yeah, that's a, that's a big word. I like that. All encompassing. Unconditional. Yeah. Christine? Sacrificial. Forgiving. Forgiving. Yeah. Compassionate. Compassionate. So Jesus says that he's talking to his apostles here that they spent three years with. You gentlemen have seen me for three years and how I have loved not just the people out there, but the people in the context of this room, in this setting, the Last Supper. And he says, I want you to carry on that legacy. In everything that you have seen me do, do it to one another. 
Now, I love the context of this because let's look at verse 1 now because he says this in the context of something incredible. John 13, starting at verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Let me just stop there. If you knew that in eight hours you'd be hanging on a cross and I'm ballparking the numbers, how might you spend that time? I know me, and I know me too well. I would want the support of the, it would all be about me. Guys, I'm going to be dying for you by about 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Can we make this this last night about me? But he doesn't do that. He never makes it about him. Instead, look at what it says. Instead, well, look at what it says. Having loved his own who were, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father, verse 3, had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And I want to just stop there for a moment. Jesus, knowing he was about to die, and rooted in the conviction of who and what he was, he humbled himself. And he does something that's really easy to, to read on a page. But I want you to think of the reality of this. How many of you would love to spend the next 30 minutes washing your neighbor's foot? Pretty gross. Some of you are repulsed by feet. He would never go near this. Now, that's people in their proverbial Sunday best. I want you to think of a bunch of guys who've been walking on dirt paths all day. No air conditioning. It's just hot. You know, you go to Haiti, you realize what heat is real quick. Because here, we just run from an AC car to an, in, you know, an AC inside. There, you just melt. The sun's 15 feet away, it feels like. I want you to imagine the feet of these men. There's nothing pretty about this. There's nothing glamorous about this. There's nothing appealing about this. In fact, this is the work of a literal servant or slave that would occupy the house just to help with these jobs because people of means and capacity, they didn't want to do this job. And notice how these disciples who had spent nothing but three years hearing and Jesus teach on love, and none of them were quick to run to the basin and get to work. Their continual argument among themselves when Jesus wasn't looking or listening was who among us is superior? Who among us is the greatest? Who's going to run the show? And then Jesus, in a moment like this, he literally does the work of a servant. Now, I want to advance the story. Let's go to verse 12. Now that you kind of have that mental image in place. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place at the head of the table. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, oh, this hurts, Jesus, don't say it. Well, he says it anyway. You should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verse 16, I truly, truly tell you, no servant is greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. By the raising of a hand, how many of you genuinely want to experience and operate in the favor of God? His rich, beautiful blessing. He just told you how to access it. By the most inglamorous, selfless of means, serve. So if we are called to love one another, which is on the screen, which is there because it's in the Bible a lot, we are called to do that following the example that was set forth by Christ himself. And we call him Lord and teacher. And if that's how he operated as the master, which he says, 
We just read it. How much more should we be willing to do the same? It's easy to serve Jesus in some ways. It's painful and difficult to serve the person sitting next to you. Husband, if you're here and your wife is here, to what degree would you be described as a servant to that blessed woman? And to what degree is the inverse also true? Do we serve our children? Do you serve the people in this room? In a generation of churches that can't seem to get along well with another, one another, you know what the answer is? This. You want to know how many churches close or split because they just can't play well in the same sandbox? You want to know what that is? It's a failure to embrace this principle. Because somewhere along the lines, well-meaning Christians thought it was all about them. And Jesus has this crazy idea that it's all about him. And he's going to stand by that. Point number two as we go on to loving one another. This kind of love demonstrates the reality that we do belong to him. Jesus put it this way in John 13. If you want to read verse 35, if you're already there, you can. By this, speaking of a, a love for one another, by your love for one another, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Very quickly, because I'm running low on time. What's the best evidence that we're truly is? Is it the songs that we sing or the statements of faith that we memorize or our religi religiosity or our piety or our political views? As good as those things might be in their place, I suppose. No. The single best evidence that you truly belong to him is how you treat one another. By this, everyone will know that you are mine. Without going too deep into this point, if you read the book of Acts chapter 2, don't turn there, you'll see this incredible verse. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want you to think of just the logistics of that. If every day people were coming to Jesus Christ, how long would it take to fill these seats? How long would it take to go to two services or three? I know of a church in Connecticut, they went to seven services before they could build the new place because all they did was love other people. And I have to ask myself as the pastor, what caused the early church to add people daily who were being saved. And the only answer in context is this incredible love for God that was manifested in a love for one another. They, speaking of the early church, devoted themselves to apostolic teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the wonders and the signs that were performed. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to those who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And then at the end it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You want to be that kind of church and have that kind of result? We have to do the work of being that kind of church. I want to see people genuinely reach for Jesus Christ. We live in a generation where the churches that grow are basically just cannibalizing smaller churches. But actual kingdom growth? No. And something like 88% of churches are shrinking. 88%. You can't prove to me that the Lord wants it that way. I just don't see it. I don't think the problem fundamentally is him. I think it's the application of his word by modern believers. And I'm talking to me as much as I'm talking to you. If you think I'm shaming or guilting you, that's not the spirit. This is a call that we have to be willing to live differently if we want to see different results. How do we define insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Now, I commend us in a lot of respects because in so many ways, this is a healthy church, but this is a call to go deeper. 
we have not yet exhausted our capacity to love one another or to love our enemies or to love the people that are out there or to love the Lord fully. We're not there yet. We have a lot of room to grow, and that's okay. I'm willing to, in a sense, man, or depending on your gender, a woman up to that challenge. But let's do it, and let's see what happens. Because God can do incredible things for those who are willing to say, Lord, it's all about you and your mission. Final point, I do end with this. Our love for one another makes the invisible God visible to those who don't know him. I'll repeat that. Our love for one another makes the invisible God visible to those who don't know him. There's an old adage, I can't take credit for it, but it's a good principle. You may be the only Jesus someone ever has the chance to meet. Translation, people come to understand what Jesus is like through us. Because many people who don't know him aren't interested in coming to church. They're just not. They're having breakfast right now. They're never going to open a Bible. Hear me on this. We think that people value God's word. They don't. I spend the bulk of my time trying to get Christians to value God's word. They don't care. They're never going to open and look at John 3.16. It's just not going to happen most likely. The only way that they're ever going to encounter what Jesus is like is you. And it's me. Which in one sense places a huge responsibility I feel on me daily and on you. But there's also a joy in this because it gives my life a degree of meaning I would not have otherwise. Where everything that I do matters because someone is always watching. How many of you have kids? They're always watching, always taking notes. That's just how the world is. Is your patience for others indicative of his patience? We serve a God who is so patient. How many will admit God puts up with a lot from us? Oh, but somebody cuts us off and it's game on. The language that can come. The mouth that is so dedicated toward praising God can suddenly go a very different direction. Is your kindness for others an adequate expression of his kindness? Do people see his grace, his mercy, his compassion, his faithfulness and integrity and honor in and through you? And finally, what of his love? Does the world come to understand and experience his invisible love by our visible example? I'm not looking for an answer. I think it's important for us to ask tough questions, though. And individually to say, okay, Lord, if I have to be honest, I'm not really that aware or that mindful of the kind of life that I live. Change that. Oh, he would, he would move so quickly in your direction. I'm going to hit a rabbit trail. People say to me all the time, the Lord's not hearing my prayers. All lies this way. Maybe you're just asking the wrong ones. God, give me a million dollars so I can buy a, get out of debt and have a new car. Yawn. Does he care about your needs? Absolutely. But he's not looking just to spoil you for the sake of spoiling you. That makes sense? You begin to pray, Lord, you change me. And you use me to reach people in my family and in my community and to serve people and to demonstrate you to others. Oh, he is going to run toward that. I'm telling you, he's, he's putting these things on my heart because I'm wrestling with these personally. Because I realize that the invisible virtues of God have to be made visible in my life. First John chapter 4, final verse of the morning, final point of the morning. No one has ever seen God, the author says. But if we love each other, if we love one another, as the screen says, God lives in us, and I love this, and his love is brought to full expression in us. In other words, we do serve a God who's invisible. If God was real, just have him show himself. It doesn't work that way. But the reality of who and what he is is demonstrated, it's expressed through his love. I think of the quote from Gandhi that I found online. If it weren't for Christians, I would have been one. Hmm. 
We're under obligation to love God, those in need, our enemies, and one another. Remember that our call to love is to follow his example of love, a love that reflects that we are truly his, and a love that makes the invisible God visible. I'm going to read this, and I will end with this, and I'm not lying to you. Juan Carlos Ortiz, just a pastor out there somewhere, but the story is of him. He led a church in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and he wrote a book called Disciple. Never read it, by the way. And at one point, he realized that his church was ed educated beyond their experience. They knew a lot more than they were putting into practice. Many of them were getting two to three sermons a week, plus Bible studies in their homes. Does that sound familiar, by the way, to the modern American church? Everything's a Bible study? That's fine, but not really. Before they had the time to digest and apply one message, they were getting three more. He thought it was a time for a change. So on Sunday, he started to preach. He opened his Bible and read the following words. Love one another. And then he sat down. Didn't say anything else, he just sat down. And the congregation sat there waiting. So Ortiz, a few moments later, stood up and said again, love one another. And he sat down. The congregation began to stir nervously, the story says. When was the pastor going to start preaching, they said. So Ortiz got up a third and final time and said, love one another. And then he sat down. A man on the first row leaned over to the person next to him and said, I think the pastor wants us to love one another. And then he asked him, can I do anything for you? When his neighbor admitted that he was having some difficulties in this arena financial, the first person opened his wallet and said, let me help you. Soon, all across the auditorium, people were talking and laughing and praying and crying and giving. Why? Because they were loving one another. Now, many people would love that sermon because it was three minutes long. But if you can get it, and more importantly, if you can put it into practice, gang, you will change, your world will change, and the world around you will be revolutionized for Jesus Christ. With that being said, we are going to pray, we are going to pray then dismiss. Typically, the men uh, assemble after service to, to pray as a group. If anybody would like prayer, though, I'm happy to spend some time following service to pray with those who have need. So just come on up to the front once I say the final amen. Um, if you have little ones downstairs, just please get them. Let's not make this a time for conversation up here. Let's dedicate the sanctuary to prayer. But you can always hang out downstairs, get some coffee, linger as long as you like. Father, we are under obligation to love. Without a bunch of fancy prayers and ending, help us to do exactly that and let it start today. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen.